Today is Friday, February 25th. Uh, due to ice on the roads today, we're remote learning. Uh, our test for chapter three is on Monday. And we're finishing up the last of the review today. We've already finished the, the main review. We'll take a few minutes on Monday, see if anybody has any questions over this before we start. Uh, the last problem we left off with was this one about the cannonball. And uh, I want to come back to that one before we, before we leave here. After we're 13 questions, that'll be one we're going to look at again. Okay, so question number one is about this. Question number one from page 100 says, the net force on an object moving with constant speed and circular motion is which direction? So, you're pushed towards the center of this circle. As you go around the curve with a car on dry pavement, that road and your tires grip each other and the road will push you towards the center of that curve. But if you hit ice, the road can't do that anymore and you will slide in whatever direction you're going. So that's what would happen today. So what's going on there is centripetal acceleration C. Next one, according to the figure, and you've got the figure in front of you, looks like the speed of an object is increasing the more time it falls. I bet this is time along the bottom. Yes, it is. A few seconds. Number two, according to the trend in these data, which of the following values is most likely the speed of the object falling for six seconds? So this is five, four, three, two, one seconds. It's getting faster and faster, but it looks like it's getting more and more towards a constant uh, speed. So whatever that is at five seconds, at 20 meters per second, it's probably not going to be much more than that. Uh, so I would go with C, 20.1 meters per second. Number three, over which of the following time intervals is the acceleration of the object the greatest? Well, this is a speed versus time graph. Or actually, you could call it a velocity versus time graph because this object's, let's say, falling straight down. And the acceleration is how much it's getting faster. And the part that's getting faster, the, at the least, the part that's getting the greatest increase in speed over a time interval is where the slope is steepest. So the acceleration is highest during that first interval of time from zero to one. So the answer for three should be A, from zero to one. That's the steepest acceleration. So on a speed time graph or velocity time graph, this one could be because you're going in a straight line. The acceleration is the one with the greatest slope, has the greatest acceleration. Number three, over which of the time, or number four, over which of the following time intervals is the net force on the object the smallest? Net force. We've looked at this equation many times. Net force is mass times acceleration. And by the way, you could also have force of gravity on an object, which is its weight, is mass times acceleration of gravity. Uh, so that one we'll be using a lot. But right now we're using this one. So we want the net force to be least. As close to zero as we can get. Well, that object's going to have mass, so that means that acceleration has to be as close to zero as we can get. The least acceleration, the least slope, and that's right here. During interval time interval, I think, four to five. So I would go with number four, D. Number five, which of the following will cause the gravitational force between object A and object B to increase? And this is the same graph that we've talked about. I think it's back this way. Give me a minute. Right here. If the objects are cl close, the gravity between them goes up. And if the objects are really big, especially one of them, like planet size, that acceleration of gravity is more. So in order to have a significant amount of gravity, you have to have at least one of the objects be massive. 
asteroid massive, moon massive, planet massive, sun, star massive, and close enough to affect you. And if it gets too far away, like Jupiter is way bigger than the Earth, way more massive, but because it's so far away, we don't feel the effect of Jupiter here on, in our daily lives. So number five, I'd say increase the mass and decrease the distance. And decrease the distance is not a choice. So the only one that works is increase the mass because they don't have decrease the distance as a choice. Which of the following is a force? Only one of them is a force, and that is friction, friction force. We dealt with friction forces with the CARTS project, so you're well familiar with that. Question seven coming up, we have this other figure here. You've got it in front of you in, in the book. This one here. Question seven says, the graph sh above shows the speed of a book changes as it slides across the table. Probably I would say it's being pushed here and then it's sliding for the rest of that. So it's picking up speed versus time again. So if it asks a question about acceleration, we're gonna be looking at the slope of the curve. So it's probably pushed for half a second, gets going fast, and then slides for another almost two seconds. Over what time interval is the net force opposite the book's motion? You're accelerating it here, let's say, by pushing it. So the book's gonna... What I'm gonna get into here is not absolutely true, but it makes sense inferring it from the, from the picture, because there, there could be another, other weird things going. But, but what's most likely is the book, the book is starting at zero meters per second. You're speeding it up by pushing it, and it's going that way, velocity that way, and as soon as you're done pushing it, it keeps going that way, but its acceleration is slowing it down. So the uh, net force is opposite the book's motion, I would say, from 0.5 to 2.5, which is, well, 2.4, which is option B. Okay, number eight. How does the gravitational force change as two objects move farther apart. We're back to here again. Well, they, if they get closer together, the gravity is more between them. So it must be that as we move them apart, the gravity gets less between them. And so whatever option that is, it decreases, 8B. 8B, it decreases. Number nine, you're pushing a wood, in, and we're on page 101 now. You're pushing a wood, three ki 30 kilogram wooden crate across the floor. The force of sliding friction is 90 newtons. How much force must you exert to keep it moving with a constant velocity? Well, if you're not speeding it up and you're not slowing it down, let's look at this object for a second. That'll help answer the question. On this object, when we pushed it, it sped up because we had a net force on it. When we stopped pushing it, it slowed down. It had a net force on it. Friction here. In the case of number nine, if you are going a constant velocity, it says, that means the forces are balanced. It's not accelerating because there's no net force. And if the forces are balanced, then that other force pushing back must be the same. So, the constant velocity means that the object is not accelerating, so the net force should be zero. So you're pushing with 90 newtons. You're pushing with 90 newtons, friction is 90 newtons, and it just keeps sliding at a constant velocity. If you stop pushing, it'll decelerate and stop. If you push harder, it'll accelerate. But if the velocity is constant, we know the forces are balanced because there's no net force. There's no acceleration. So if the acceleration is zero, the 
the net force must be zero. The mass isn't zero. The mass didn't change. So with, it must not be accelerating, so the net force must be zero. Skydiver with a mass of 60 kilograms jumps from an airplane. Five seconds, the force of air resistance is 300 newtons. What is the skydiver's acceleration five seconds over after jumping? Oh, tricky question. Air resistance is 300. You have to know the skydiver's weight. And take that weight and subtract the air resistance and the leftover is net force. And that will cause the acceleration. Okay. Uh, I want to see something here. All right, there's a simpler, quicker way to do it. Even easier, even quicker. The way I described it would work. It's a little more intuitive, but this is quicker. So we know that the air resistance is 300 newtons, and the mass of this skydiver is 60 kilograms. That acceleration that the air resistance wants to make is this math problem. So remember, you have to solve for A here, so you want to divide by 60 kilograms, so this cancels, but to be equal, we divide this by 60 kilograms. And A is 300 divided by 60, which is the same as 30 divided by 6, which is five, five newtons per kilogram, or five meters per second squared. But gravity is accelerating this skydiver down at 9.8. So you have to take 9.8 minus the five that the air resistance is trying to make, and you should get 4.8 meters per second squared because these accelerations are opposite. Oh, by the way, you can, on the test, use 10 meters per second squared. It's really close to this, and it makes the math easier. I mean, they're 98% the same. Number 11, a pickup truck is carrying a load of gravel. A driver hits a bump and gravel falls out. The mass of the truck is half as large. It must have hit a hard bump. If the net force on the truck doesn't change, how does the accelerations change? So let's say the truck is punching the gas and accelerating, hits a bump, out comes the gravel, and now it weighs less, has less mass is more important, has less mass. How's the acceleration gonna change? Well, if the mass drops to half, okay, so this stays the same. This number stays the same. If the mass goes down to half, what must the acceleration do? It must go up to how much if the mass is half and you get the same, same acceleration, or same net force, same force produced by the engine. It must go up to double. If the force stays same as the mass decreases, acceleration increases, how much? The acceleration will double. The acceleration will double. Number 12. Use the table below. You got a car, the more massive the car is, the greater the stopping distance, basically. What is the relation? Well, I just said that. I just gave you the answer. I've used a Google spreadsheet to make this, so I went into Google like you did in class when we did the floor surfer lab. I plugged in this data for the mass for the car. And the stopping distances. So I plugged in that data from the table and Google made the, made the, the graph. So the more the mass is, the greater the stopping distance. This relationship, by the way, is a direct proportion. They are in a line. It's a linear function. In real life, it would not be, I don't think. Eh, no, it should be. Never mind that. It should be. 
Number 13, give an example of a force applied to an object that does not change the objects. Like, I could push on this wall. It doesn't matter how hard I push, it's not going anywhere. There's no motion, there's no acceleration. So let me give you an example from here. I could push a washing machine and it would be at rest because the push would be balanced by the static friction in the, in the, against the floor. The forces are balanced, there's not acceleration, the velocity doesn't change. It's not important that the velocity is zero so much, it's important that the velocity is going to remain zero. It's not going to increase or decrease. Okay, so that's that. Make sure you do this work, get it all down, get a picture of it, send it to me. But before you leave, I want to look at this Canon example again, which means if we're looking at the same problem twice, hmm, what do you think that means? Here's the extra question. The Canon shoots and it rolls backwards because it's shot. That's called a recoil. The gun does the same thing. At one and a half meters per second in a cannonball that is lighter is shooting out the other end. Now this cannonball, if the cannon is 900 kilograms, the cannonball is three. This is 300 times more massive. So what will happen is the cannonball will go 300 times faster than that. So that's a real quick way to solve this problem. The way to set it up though is set momentum equal to momentum. Momentum is mass times velocity. So one is the cannonball, one is the cannon. Actually they're sitting there with zero. So the cannonball plus the cannonball added the cannon plus the cannonball added together is zero. So they're equal and opposite. So if you put them on either side of the equal sign, it makes it work. Mass times velocity equals mass times velocity. Then you put everything where it goes. Cannonball's mass is 900. Cannon, or I'm sorry, cannon's mass is 900 kilograms. Cannon's mass is 1.5 meters per second, the speed of a good brisk walk or a light jog. Cannonball's mass is three kilograms. We solve for V. We divide by 3.0 kilograms to cancel this, but to be equal, we add divide by 3.0 kilograms over here. Kilograms cancels. 900 divided by three is 300, and 300 times one and a half is 450 meters per second is the speed of the cannonball. Okay, so do a good job reviewing Test Monday. We'll take a few minutes to review first.